I appreciate the applause, but we haven't done anything yet, so. Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. We are so glad you are here and excited that you've come to worship with us this morning. So let's stand if you're able to stand and let's sing together. Your grace is enough. a seat this morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's a little better. Are we not happy to be here this morning? Four of you are. Yes. You got your work cut out for you, brother. All right, hot dogs. We are accepting financial contributions for our hot dog giveaway in July. If you would like to make a donation, it would be appreciated. Also, if you're willing to help, there's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. But for those of you who do not know, for the past 20 some odd years, we've given away hot dogs on uh, fireworks night down at Kids Corner, so just for something to do. During, <laughs> during prayer time, continue to pray for Roberta Newton, who is in rehab, recovering from surgery. There's a Get Well card at the Welcome Center. Uh, please share your thoughts on the card. 
please pray for Alexis McLean, Bailey's co-worker, who gave birth to a set of twins last week at 27 weeks into her pregnancy. They just found out today that one of the babies is getting transferred to U of M, today being the other day when Bailey called in. What day was that they transferred, Bailey? Okay, so Wednesday the baby was transferred to U of M, surgery is tomorrow. Uh, so please pray for successful procedure, both babies as they grow and gain strength, and the parents as they are on this journey. Uh, we have a praise. Who likes praises? Six of you. We're getting better. We're almost an active church now. Carly Milkey, Vicki Olson's granddaughter, who had open heart surgery on the 31st, is doing well. So there's a, there's a praise. Yes. Graduates, I saw one of you. I almost walked into the stand looking at you. Come on, Carson. Cody's not here this morning. I don't see him. Should we embarrass Carson or just have him come up? <laughs> Congratulations to the graduates, Cody Hampton and Carson Rooker. Uh, let's pray for them during prayer time as they take their next step in life. The next step will be turning and going that way when we're all done. All right. There's that for you. So let's bow in prayer. Oh, there's this for you too so Linda doesn't commit homicide this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for Carson and Cody. I pray that you would bless them with many things. Uh, you would open their eyes to what you would have them do as they walk a path in your favor. I pray that you would be with Carly as she continues to recover. Continue to give her strength and stamina and, and a, a, a perfect healing. I pray you would be with Alexis McLean uh, in regards to these, these births of the twins. Be with the doctors as they proceed with the surgery tomorrow. Uh, I, we lift them up in your, your hands, Father. We know that you are in charge of all things and you cover all things in your will. Pray, Lord God, you would continue to be with Roberta as she heals from this, the, the fall. I pray that you would help her recover fully and that we might see her back soon. In Jesus' heavenly name, amen. Let's stand. We can stand again, right?
his way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome we will not be just another minute let's let's read the scripture together let's do that this morning from the book of psalm chapter 11 verses 1 through 7 let's read along together in the lord i take refuge how then can you say to me flee like a bird to your mountain for look the wicked bend their bows they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. You may have a seat. While Mike was getting set up, uh, hi, I'm Adam Parmenter. My wife and I, uh, my wife Marge and I are new here. Uh, getting to know some of you, it's been great to be here. Dean and I have been friends since we were five. So, And my son Michael is just recently lead, beginning to lead a church plant in Kingman, Arizona. And so he's on a preaching tour out into the Midwest to find out what rain and green things look like again. <laughs> so uh, what a wonderful opportunity we have to, to be with him in church today and, and uh 
He's going to sing an old song that we grew up singing uh, when Dean and I were in Sojourn. It's called One Step Away. Hello? There we go. your son's planning in like Arizona is it because it's warm yeah I know I've also I felt called to plant a church in Bora Bora or or Bali or Hawaii I'm not picky (sighs) (laughs) over the past couple weeks we've been looking at the subject of prayer And uh, we looked at what prayer is and why we should pray, why prayer is important. We looked at why Jesus prayed, and today I want to spend some time looking at uh, Jesus' life, and I want us to look at when Jesus prayed, because if he's going to serve as an example for our prayer life, I want to know those things. And so we're going to be focusing on that today. 
Uh, the first time the Bible mentions Jesus praying was at his baptism. Now, all four of the gosp Gospels give some kind of account of this event, but uh, only Luke's account mentions Jesus was praying uh, as he was baptized. And we find this account in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through uh, 22, which read, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, in whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now before I address why Jesus was praying at this time, uh, let me give you a little bit of background uh, regarding his baptism. Because you see, throughout the Bible, um, baptism served as a symbol of cleansing. And the Old Testament individuals did cleansing as a symbolic way of making sure they were free from sins. And usually in the Old Testament, individuals baptized themselves. So when Moses was getting ready to go on top of the a mountain, the people were to prepare themselves. They were to go and wash and cleanse themselves. You could say that they were going to be baptized. But then along comes John the Baptist, and he's the forerunner of Jesus. He is making straight the paths for his master to come. He was the one who was to say, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him. John's baptism was one of repentance. In other words, when he baptized with water, it was symbolic as a cleansing for sin. Now, John's baptism was in accordance with Old Testament law. In other words, while it represented cleansing from sin, sacrifices were still required. It wasn't enough just to be baptized. You still had to make your sacrificial offerings on behalf of sin for the blood needs to cover sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Last I looked, when you're baptized, you're not shedding your blood. Hopefully. But what was unique about John's baptism is that unlike others doing the baptism to their themselves, John baptized others. No one had done that before. Up until then, Cleansing was done by the individuals himself. And now here comes Jesus. And he comes to be baptized by John, interestingly. And he is unlike anyone else that had come to John to be baptized. If individuals were coming upon repentance of sin, and if Jesus is sinless, wouldn't it just make sense to ask the question, well, then why then? was Jesus being baptized? Well, there's a number of reasons that seem to make sense. And the first reason is given by Jesus himself. So when Jesus came to John to be baptized, John was very, very reluctant to baptize him. John knew who this individual was. After all, he was his cousin, right? And even though he was the forerunner of Jesus, John understood that he himself, John, was a sinner. And he also knew the one that was coming to him to be baptized was sinless. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior that would come and save his people from their sins. And that's why John told Jesus, hey, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. When, what does Jesus mean when he says that uh, he had come to fulfill all righteousness. None of the accounts, none of the Gospels give us an explanation as to what this means. We do know that Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God, right? Which is characterized, by the way, by righteousness. We do know that the Messiah will be the sin bearer. And as far as Israel's concerned, Jesus not only is the perfect sacrifice, but he is the high priest who is going to offer up that perfect sacrifice to the Father on behalf of our sins. But there's another reason, one more meaning that is important. And as I mentioned over the past couple of weeks, this has to do with Jesus' humanity. Remember, we talked about that extensively over the last few weeks. Jesus is like us in every way, yet without sin. 
He is fully God and he is fully man. Being sinless, Jesus comes to be baptized to identify with us. Not because he had sins to be forgiven, but he came to identify us in every way. It's an identification. It's an expression of humility. Can you imagine that? God coming to earth to die for me? Yeah, I'm just astounded like that. Just as much as he came to die for you. I know you're probably saying, yeah, I understand that, Jerry. Well, he came to die for you as well. As 2 Corinthians puts it, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. That's what he told John. Another reason why Jesus may have been praying is because following his baptism, he was about to launch into his earthly ministry, his earthly mission phase. Therefore, it seems to me that he would be praying to express his dependence on God. Remember, we talked about that. Jesus relied upon God. He relied upon the Holy Spirit to empower him to carry out his ministry. And so as the heavens open up and the Spirit comes down upon him, divine power falls on him as well, as the Father recognizes that Jesus is about to start his ministry. And therefore, in a way, he gets this divine commission. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. can't wait to stand before Jesus someday and said, you're my son. With you, I'm well pleased. So follow this. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And Luke mentions that Jesus was in the de desert for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now, I know Scripture doesn't comment at all on what Jesus was doing over this time. I think that's left up to us to try and think about what Jesus may have been doing. He did not grab a lawn chair, put it out, put a towel on there, kick back with a nice cold glass of lemonade and just lay out there and cook for 40 days. I think, and I could be wrong, but I think Jesus was praying during those 40 days, don't you? I mean, what else are you going to do in the wilderness, right? He's not eating. He's not drinking. He's not socializing with anyone. Only thing he's doing is being tempted. Oh boy, that's a lot of fun. I think he was praying. Mark mentions Jesus was also with wild animals. Maybe he's praying that the wild animals wouldn't be coming by him. I don't know. But I think he was praying because he was dependent on the Father. He was dependent on the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit empowering him, how could he carry out his ministry? Therefore, we can conclude that Jesus prayed before important events, before making important decisions. I mean, how can you launch into an important public ministry without first bathing that in prayer. Are you praying for your ministry? Of course you are. Right? And you're praying for him so that he'd be praying for his ministry. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus begins drawing disciples, people who followed him. And Luke says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Wow. I confess I've never done that. I hope that doesn't diminish my value in your eyes. I mean, right now, my stage in life, 10 o'clock, I'm out. And maybe if I get real lucky, 11, you know, but Jesus is praying all night. Now, Luke doesn't share all the specifics. He simply mentions that on one of the days that Jesus was with his followers, he went and he prayed all night. 
all night. Again, no mention as to why Jesus prayed or what he prayed about. However, in Luke 16, 13, we can draw a strong conclusion as to what the focus of his prayer might have been. For when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. How many disciples came when Jesus called? We don't know. Perhaps a whole bunch, right? But he only selects 12 out of those individuals. 12 individuals to serve as apostles. So Jesus prays before his baptism. Jesus prays before important events. And we can see from Jesus' pattern that on occasion he prayed all night. He also prayed early in the morning. When Jesus was in Capernaum, Jesus remained very active, and he, and he taught in the synagogues, he cast out demons, he healed the sick, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Mark mentions that when evening arrived, people brought to Jesus all sorts of sick individuals, all sorts of demon-possessed individuals. And he mentions how the whole town, the whole town gathered at the door of Peter's mother-in-law. And so throughout the night, Jesus healed the sick. Throughout the night, he cast out demons. Talk about having a ministry responsibility that just never seems to end. And then Mark says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Where was this solitary place? Who knows? Who knows? It wasn't in his mother-in-law's backyard. It was a place where Jesus could be alone. It was a place where Jesus could be isolated from everyone else. As we already noted, Jesus prayed one time all night on a mountain, which is probably a very solitary place. It's probably solitary also because the majority of individuals were at home sleeping. It was nighttime. When he was at Peter's mother-in-law, he worked late into the night. Late into the night and into the wee hours of the morning. And Jesus knew that eventually he just needed to get away. He needed to be alone. He needed to spend time in prayer. And when, he's, when he was finished then, we read that Peter found him because Peter was looking for him. Where did Jesus go? And the group left for Galilee where they continued to do what they'd been doing the day before. They'd been preaching and casting out demons, healing the sick. Sometimes a person just needs solitude, Right? especially when the demands of life continue to press upon you. There are times when you just need privacy. Don't you find that? Sometimes I just got to get away from people. Especially after I watch the news. <laughs> got to get away from people. I got to be alone. Sometimes you can get away in private, and be with a group of people. And Luke records one such event. So you already noted Luke uh, doesn't always give us the specific details, but in Luke uh, 9.18, he simply mentions what happened one day. And he said, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? Isn't that kind of interesting? I'm there in private. In other words, I'm not in a group setting but I'm in private with my peeps. I'm in private with my disciples. We're together. Then Luke gets a little bit more specific, and in verse 28, we read about eight days after Jesus said this. He took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. What a, what a thing to behold, right? 
Now, we refer to this event as the transfiguration because Jesus, his appearance changed drastically. And then Moses and Elijah appear, and they begin talking to Jesus. That would amaze me. How did that happen? Well, the point is, while Jesus uh, was on the mountain in private, Privacy doesn't always mean that you are alone. And in this case, there were others with Jesus as well. On the other hand, privacy sometimes means you are alone without anybody else around you. On one occasion, Jesus had been teaching and healing people all day. And then when evening arrived, the disciples suggested that Jesus send everybody away so that they can go into the villages and into the towns to find something to eat. They had been so captivated with what was taking place all day that no one stopped and thought, hey, maybe it's lunchtime, maybe it's dinner time. And Jesus tells his disciples, you feed them. Don't send them away. Unfortunately, the only food that they had were five loaves of bread and two fish. Certainly not enough food to feed thousands of individuals. Or was it? So Jesus had the people sit down and he took the bread and the fish and he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. And he gave that to the disciples so that they could in turn give it to everybody who was seated on the ground and everyone ate to the full capacity. Jesus fed 5,000 men beside women and children. And when all the leftovers were collected, they still filled 12 baskets. I want that kind of food when I go to Walmart. Give me a bag of chicken. We get done having chicken dinner. I still have 12 baskets left over. That would be cool. Oh, that can't happen. Supply chain. Immediately afterwards, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to go out on the other side of the water after Jesus dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone, alone. So on this occasion, privacy means just that, all by yourself, isolated, no one else around. Speaking of feeding 5,000 individuals, this event also shows us that Jesus prayed before he ate. Prayed before he ate. Matthew's account says, And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. That's why we pray before we eat. Another example is found in Jesus' encounter with the two individuals two men on the road to Emmaus. And after he explained to these two men what was said in the scripture concerning himself, the two strongly urged Jesus to spend the night with him because they didn't recognize him at this time. And it was evening, and so they invited Jesus to come and stay the evening with them, to take time and eat with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks. And he broke it and began to give it to them. Yeah, that, then they recognized who he was. Jesus prayed during his baptism. He prayed before important events. He prayed in the night. He prayed in the early morning. He p- prayed in private. And he prayed before he ate. Next, we'll look at some examples of how Jesus prayed during times of crisis. Because I don't know about you, but when I face crisis, man, that's the time when I seem to be very sensitive to prayer. We looked at the event when Jesus fed the 5,000 men, women, children, five loaves. I want to look at what the Apostle John said following this event. So after Jesus fed everyone and he dispersed them, Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. 
withdrew to a mountain by himself. What's the crisis? Well, the verse before this says that people were so overwhelmed, so amazed with the miracles that Jesus had performed. They were so blown away by what Jesus was doing and their realization that this was the one the Old Testament prophesied about, the one who was to come, they decided that they were going to make Jesus king. Yes, they misunderstood, didn't realize that Jesus' kingdom was not an earthly kingdom, it was a heavenly kingdom. So they were getting ready to make him king by force, if necessary. But that again is not why Jesus came. He didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish a heavenly kingdom. So he withdraws and he goes to a mountain where he could be alone. So I think where he could pray. Dependence upon the Father. An even greater example of how Jesus prayed during times of crisis at least for me, has found what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that he was arrested and would be crucified. Jesus knew what was going to happen because it was a part of God's divine plan. And so Jesus takes Peter and he takes James and he takes John and he brings them with him and he says, let's go pray. You stay alert and keep watch so that I can go by myself and pray. And going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Luke says Jesus was in distress And he prayed so intensely that the sweat that was dripping from him was filled with blood and it fell to the ground. And who can forget what happened while Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying. And before he takes his last earthly breath on this planet, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Jesus prayed in times of crisis. I need to share just one more category of when Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed when he just was too busy. When he's just too busy in life. We already saw an example of this. We looked at a number of passages regarding to when Jesus prayed, such as the feeding of the 5,000 or teaching them all day and all night, so much so that he had to go to a mountain to pray, needed to recharge his batteries. On another occasion, Jesus had just healed a man from leprosy. And then news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely places and prayed. Had to get away, had to recharge. Life is too busy. I can't keep up this pace. That's a comforting example for me, you know? I remember hearing one time when you enter into ministry, you may be required to burn the candle at both ends. And it didn't take me long while I thought that was so spiritual sounding. I'm burning my candle at both ends. Till a friend pointed out to you, yeah, you're quicker on your way to burnout than I am. Oh. Crazy is some of the things we think, right? Life gets busy, just too busy. Sometimes we need to slow down. One of the ways of slowing down is spending time in prayer. So Jesus prayed during his baptism. He prayed before important events. He prayed at night. He prayed early in the morning. He prayed in private. He prayed before he ate. And he prayed in times of crisis. And he prayed 
when he was just too busy. Jesus took opportunities to pour his heart out to the Father, to continue to be dependent on him, to stay connected with the Father through prayer. Because as we talked about on numerous occasions already, communication is essential to any relationship. And Jesus certainly had a deep and abiding relationship with the Father. If you recall last week, I mentioned that there are three reasons why Jesus prayed. And one of those reasons was to serve an example as an example for you and I of when we should pray, of how we should pray, of why we should pray. And so looking to him as our example, how do you stack up as far as your prayer life is concerned, huh? How do you do? Do you pray before important decisions or before important events? You might not be, you might not be calling 12 apostles, but they're important events in your life. Do you pray? Do you pray at night? Can't fall asleep. Good remedy for that. Pray. The devil doesn't like you praying. Do you pray early in the morning before life hits you? Before things move so fast you can't even keep up? Do you play, pray in, in private? Maybe sometimes with a group in private? Sometimes alone, just you and God. Do you pray before eating? And by the way, I have to tell you this, there's no reason to be in a restaurant and bow your head and close your eyes. That's for you. God can hear you if you have your eyes open. Just letting you know. The important thing is giving thanks, right? Praying before you eat. Praying in times of crisis, oh my goodness. That sounds like a no-brainer, but do you? Do you pray when you're just too busy? Too busy. Let's follow the example of Jesus. May that affect our prayer life. I think it's a pretty good idea, and I would believe that you feel the same way. Let's spend some time in prayer before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
This time we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. A time when we remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. A time when we remember that one day He will return again for us. It's good to remember because it's so easy to forget. But you stop and think we do this only once a month. Some churches do it more often. But at least once a month, we as a body of Christ get to remember that Jesus established a new covenant in his blood for us. No bulls, no goats, no rams, no birds. His blood was shed on the cross. Perfect sacrifice for our sin. He provided a way for us to have our sins be forgiven and have life everlasting with him. So we partake of these elements. They have no significance in and of themselves other than they remember, they help us remember that Jesus was beaten and he was tortured on our behalf. He was nailed to a cross where he died and how he was buried and how he rose again on the third day. And so when we partake of these elements, we, are, we remember that we've entered into this covenant with him. And so I'm going to invite you to just stand, kind of separate yourself as you're, you're coming. We're still in the midst of a pandemic. Come partake of those elements here, and, and then we will uh, take the bread, take the cup together. So why don't you slip out of your seat and come forward.
because he's worthy, we're worthy. Hmm? Do you join me in declaring scripture? And when he had taken some bread, he blessed it and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, if you'd join me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and gave thanks. He said, this cup which is poured out for you, for many, for forgiveness of sins, is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink. Not only can we not forget what Jesus has done for us, we have to live in light of that because someday Jesus will be returning again for us. And so before we're dismissed, would you stand and let's unite our voices together and sing one more declaration of praise to God, our God reigns, as soon as I can get this going. <laughs>
So let's live in light of that truth. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith. La, la, la.